In the late 1600s, settlers of Chebacco, a tiny coastal village in Massachusetts, now known as Essex, broke away from the town of Ipswich to create their own parish. They built a meeting house and designated an acre lot for a graveyard, true indicators at that time of a community's desire for autonomy. Until then, the faithful men of Chebacco Parish carried their deceased, as was the custom of the day, more than six miles to the center of Ipswich Common to honor and bury their dead. Nearly a century and a half later, the villagers' sacred burial ground became the site of the largest recorded grave robbing in New England's history. I'm Corey Kugaroo for 1623 Studios, and this is the story of the Essex Body Snatcher. Thomas Sewell was born in a small village on the Kennebec River near Augusta, Maine in 1786. He was a remarkably sharp young man, fascinated by medicine and anatomy, two fields that boomed in the wake of the gruesome Revolutionary War, when ordinary folks of simple means were often forced to care for the wounded and diseased on their own. The war also created conflict amongst the largely pious public who reviled or reveled in the new nation's legal separation of church and state. Many Christian ministries throughout the freshly formed United States fractured from the Church of England. All had different beliefs on death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul. To expand his education, Sewell moved to Chebacco Parish in 1809, boarding at the home of Miriam Choate. The Choates were one of the area's first families whose wealth and legacy were well established. As part of their boarding agreement, Miriam, a recent widower, had Thomas tutor her eldest sons on various subjects. She also allowed the stately stranger to court her daughter, Mary. Sewell was driven and ambitious. He enrolled in Harvard and by age 24 gained prominence for an award-winning dissertation on diseases of the breasts of nursing women. Shortly after graduating from Harvard Medical School, Thomas became an early member of the prestigious Massachusetts Medical Society. Founded in 1781, the MMS publishes the New England Journal of Medicine, the most widely read and cited medical journal in the world, and is the oldest continuously operating medical association in the country. The society licensed Thomas Sewell as a physician for the Commonwealth in 1812. He married Mary the following year and resided at the Choate House. Dr. Sewell became the respected physician for Chebacco Parish and treasurer of Ipswich's Second Parish Church. Despite having its own meeting house and burial ground, Chebacco was still technically part of Ipswich. This was a source of frustration for locals, and Dr. Sewell spoke loudly on a committee formed by the people of Chebacco Parish to petition the state legislature to form their own town. Meanwhile, medicine as a profession in the United States exploded, especially in New England. Medical schools sprouted everywhere, as did family practices in every town and settlement. Sewell trained multitudes of students as they prepared for medical school. One of his specialties was anatomy, which relied heavily on dissecting human bodies for training and research. There was just one problem. In an area of 15 square miles of salt marsh and farmland with only 1,200 scattered residents, bodies for research were hard to come by. Or were they? One of those residents, Sarah Andrews, was haunted by the death of her young daughter Sally, who died on Christmas Day in 1817. Sarah had recurring nightmares that her daughter's coffin was empty. The Andrews were devout Christians who believed that in order for the deceased to be accepted into the kingdom of heaven, she or he must be buried whole in a proper grave. Cremation or dissection of the dead was blasphemous. However, Sarah's nightmares were well grounded. She had good reason to dread that her daughter was not in her coffin. For decades, news emerged about Harvard Medical School's secretive Spunker Club where anatomy students were known to dig up bodies of those without kin in Boston's nearby cemeteries for the purpose of study. At the time, Massachusetts only allowed the bodies of executed criminals to be dissected, but that number was tiny, 
so medical schools hired resurrection men to collect buried bodies on their behalf. Grave robbing, or a more accurate term, body snatching, became a dirty little side hustle. Though repugnant, body snatching was quite welcome in the medical world. Samuel Adams' son, Sam Jr., and William Eustis, the future governor of Massachusetts, were avid Harvard spunkers. The practice became so widespread that just before Sally Andrews' death, the state made body snatching a felony offense that led to fines, imprisonment, or public whippings. This was a problem for thousands of hopeful doctors. More and more residents of Tobacco Parish felt the same dread as Sarah Andrews, their neighbor in mourning. The burial ground was under a deep blanket of snow, so the village waited until the spring thaw for an investigation. When the snow melted, someone walking through the graveyard made a terrifying discovery. It was a barrette on the ground amongst the Andrews family tombstone. It looked familiar. The person remembered seeing it in Sally Andrews' hair when she was laid to rest. On April 17, 1818, the town gathered with the Andrews family at the burial ground while the gravedigger exhumed Sally's coffin. The lid was pried off. Sally was gone. In a panic, villagers dug the gravesite of the next most recently deceased. That coffin was empty too. They dug another and another. In all, eight of their friends' and neighbors' bodies were missing. An emergency meeting was called that evening to address the desecration. An award worth $10,000 in today's money was offered to anyone with information leading to the body snatchers. The eight coffins were left standing open in plain sight of the burial yard as a reminder and a warning. The victims were of all ages, their deaths from different causes. Seven of the eight had died within the previous six months. All eyes turned to Dr. Thomas Sewell. As the town doctor, Sewell treated many of the ill and was part of the protocol when Shabako Parish dealt with their deceased. His anatomy teachings were well publicized. The Choate House, where he lived and worked, was barely 500 feet from the parish burial ground, separated by a small grove of trees, where, it just so happened, Dr. Sewell had built a decent-sized shed. Hmm. An investigative committee searched the shed and found identifiable parts of Sally Andrews and two other corpses. In fact, Dr. Sewell was caught with other incriminating body parts he was exhibiting during one of his popular lectures. He was arrested. The scandal rocked the region, Sewell's reputation, and the Choate family name. But Sewell and the Choates had connections, lots of them. For his defense, Sewell hired one of the best legal minds in the country, attorney Daniel Webster. The former New Hampshire congressman and future Secretary of State was a leading attorney before the U.S. Supreme Court. In November of 1818, Sewell was put on trial before the State Supreme Judicial Court in Salem, charged with receiving a human body. Massachusetts v. Sewell was costly, sensational, and drawn out. The trial was twice postponed until the fall of 1819. Sewell was eventually found guilty of two counts of knowingly and willfully receiving, concealing, and disposing of two bodies, including Sally Andrews. He was fined $800 and ordered to leave the Commonwealth. By the time Sewell was escorted to the Choate House to gather his belongings, Chebacco Parish, reeling from the scandal, had legally separated from Ipswich to become its own entity, Essex. A solemn service was held for the eight exhumed victims. They were reinterred together with their recovered body parts in a mass grave at the old burial ground where its hearse house now stands. A hearse house, incidentally, is a garage where horse-drawn carriages would transfer coffins to cemeteries. The hearse house at Essex's old burial ground was built atop the mass grave in 1840, barely two decades after the crimes. It still holds two hearses, a carriage hearse for summer and a sleigh hearse for winter, as well as two keeping coffins utilized during the customary in-home wakes of the era. The hearse house is believed to be one of only three left in the U.S., but I digress.
Not all was lost for Dr. Thomas Sewell, quite the contrary. Incredibly, his expertise and actions set him up beautifully for the rest of his life. The Choate stood by him, and his name was certainly still respected within the medical community. Upon Daniel Webster's suggestion, Sewell and wife Mary relocated to Washington, D.C. Once there, Webster introduced the Sewells to Washington's high society. Sewell was one of the founders of the first university in the nation's capital, Columbian College, now known as George Washington University, where he was a professor of physiology and anatomy, a department he eventually chaired. He gave the commencement address to the college's medical school in 1827. The topic? The importance of good moral conduct. Dr. Sewell turned out to be a bigger name in the nation's capital than he was in Chebacco Parish. He became a renowned local physician and an international expert in phrenology, the study of the shape and size of craniums as an indicator of character and mental ability. He was also a leading temperance activist who believed that alcohol was the root of most diseases. His anatomical lithographs of alcohol disease stomachs were printed into hundreds of thousands of copies distributed worldwide to learning institutions, hospitals, prisons. They were even delivered to every single resident of New York State. Sewell also joined the Methodist Episcopal Church and became a professor of religion. Sewell was actively involved in politics, stumping for brother-in-law Rufus Choate, one of the boys young Thomas tutored when he boarded at the Choate House. Rufus would become a Massachusetts state senator, succeeding Daniel Webster. All of this within a handful of years of being found guilty of body snatching and banished from Massachusetts. But wait, there's more. Dr. Thomas Sewell was also a medical advisor to not one, not two, but three U.S. presidents, even being appointed to head of the penitentiary system in Washington under President John Tyler. In the latter part of his life, Sewell suffered from the debilitating effects of tuberculosis, then called consumption, believed to be contracted when treating a patient. It also happened to be what killed young Sally Andrews. The illness cost Sewell the use of his voice and led to his retirement from lecturing. Sewell died in 1845 at age 59, having never returned to Essex. It's said that the number of people who attended Dr. Sewell's funeral was the largest ever recorded for a private citizen in Washington, D.C. Today, one can enjoy self-guided walking tours of historic Essex that encompass 16 points of interest, including the Cho Homestead where Thomas Sewell resided and several protected properties and green spaces associated with the Choate family. You can also visit the old burial ground and its hearse house, which is adjacent to a schoolhouse built in 1835 that now holds the archives for the Essex Historical Society and Shipbuilding Museum. As for grave robbing and body snatching, slavery and the Civil War further perpetuated the practice to the benefit of medical institutions in the United States well into the 20th century. Nowadays, about 20,000 people a year donate their bodies to medical research and education. However, for the morbidly fascinated, there remains a niche market for human remains. Which brings us back to Harvard. In 2023, the manager of Harvard Medical School's morgue was arrested for stealing and selling body parts, a story that dug up Harvard's sordid past. In a terse statement, Harvard Medical School said, we are appalled to learn that something so disturbing could happen on our campus, a community dedicated to healing and serving others. 